everybody. Welcome to Voices of Customer Experience. I'm your host, Crystal Garrett, and co-hosting with me today is Worthix CMO, Mary Drummond. Hi. Glad to be here, Crystal. Thanks for having me on again. Today, our special guest is Rachel McBrarity. She is a customer experience executive with vast experience in developing customer strategies. She's designed brand-enhancing experiences, and Rachel's a pioneer in the use of digital, Internet of Things, and analytics to create novel experiences. Rachel, we can't wait to hear what you have to share with us. Thank you for calling in today. Sir, great to be here. Thanks so much for having me. So uh, we wanted to talk to you today, Rachel, about evolving the practice of customer experience. But before we jump into that, I want to highlight that you are an artist at heart. You have your BFA in design. And so tell us kind of what began your journey uh, and landed you at customer experience. Yeah, that's a, that's a question I get a lot. How the heck did you get from being a graphic designer and a painter to working in technology and customer experience? Um, yeah, I think it's, you know, at the end of the day, you think about design. Design is about solving problems and driving outcomes. And really at the heart of what customer experience is about is designing better experiences for people. So a lot of the tools and capabilities you learn as a designer really can get applied to the business of customer experience. So I had started out in um, doing book design and illustration, which is information design. And then I'll date myself, right? As the internet came along, there was a huge need for information designers. So I became an information architect and building some of the first web-based applications. And so that really launched my career in technology. And then I got completely fascinated with the notion of internet of things and connecting to the physical world for those experiences. Um, you know, so that's really how, you know, that's the short version of how I went from sort of print into, into technology and customer experience. Recently, I have noticed a strong trend in people from design actually moving into customer experience, not necessarily graphic design, but uh, design per se, actually process designing. But I, I do understand how that works. And um, actually, I'm quite fascinated by how much design ties into customer experience and how it results in more positive experiences for the end user. Um, we've tried recently to invite people from design, specific designers like uh, UX designers or customer journey designers to hear their point of view as well. But one thing that I know we've discussed before, you and I, Rachel, and, and we really wanted to, to put some focus on that is the fact that uh, a lot of CXers have been exploring that traditional methodologies don't necessarily correlate with either the bottom line or with uh, um, churn and revenue inside of companies. So what are your thoughts on the shifts that customer experience leaders and practitioners need to make to kind of better correlate what we need to do with business performance? Yeah, no, um, great question. And I think First, I want to start off with saying, I think it's an exciting time for CX professionals and anybody who wants to get into the field. I think there is such a tremendous opportunity to play a significant role in an organization. Um, and I'm kind of surprised we haven't seen more of it uh, because we know, we all know that Gartner quote, right? By 2016, 89% of the companies are going to compete on customer experience. But a four year later study has revealed that only 30% of companies are seeing the success. Um, in the CX return. So, you know, that's where I think why I think we have to make a shift, because I think what the data is telling us is we aren't approaching this in the right way to really play a significant role in the business as a CX professionals. So, you know, if we've got these reported lows on the projects, um, what do we need to do? And I think this is where we're at an inflection point, honestly. And there are two key things that I think need to really happen to help make these improvements. One is I think we have to change the core objectives of customer experience from defining them as really focus on those interactions to really thinking about delivering on a brand promise. And the other thing I'd love to talk about is new measures we need to adopt to help us understand customer behavior, not just how they have felt in terms of satisfaction or NPS and advocacy, but really how do we understand what are their behaviors and how are we helping them to accomplish what they need to accomplish? And I think making these shifts are going to help us to really raise the level of which we engage in an organization and really engage with the customer. If that's the case, how should it be defined? Yeah, I think from a, well, this, it, there's nothing new in what I'm going to say so it, fundamentally, but I think, yeah. So if we think about today's definition in Wikipedia, customer experience is how customers perceive the sum of their interactions with your company. 
right? And we use NPS, stat scores, time to resolution, first call responses, all those ways to know how are we doing with that interaction. But it tends to focus on that service, right? That single point in the process or that interaction that's happening, which is great. We need to make those enjoyable interactions. We need to reduce friction and, and, and save on time with the customer. But if we look at, let's take an, some, a couple of examples. Borders Books, they were number one on Forrester, Forrester CXI Index right. the year they went out of business. Fantastic experience buying books. Well, guess what? Nobody's buying books anymore. That's right. So yeah. those CX folks were probably cheering, hey, we really, you know, we're top of industry. Toys R Us had a very competitive NPS score that had been, you know, improving. They just closed their doors. So there's something, you know, that's really not aligning here in terms of the efforts that we put in as CXers and that business performance. And I think we're not going to get the investment. We're not going to get the credibility unless we shift how we think. You know, another example that I, I love is Ikea. Ikea never makes any lists. Their NPS scores are eh, but they have 7% year over year growth. So that's amazing. And that, <laughs> yeah, that tells me we're out of sync, right? We're out of sync with the business. So, you know, we need to, we need to start to think differently. I remember that when we did a, the first podcast with Joe Pine, when he gave his definition of customer experience, I mean, the man's basically the father of customer experience with his book, The Experience Economy. And one thing that he said is that when he talks about CX, he normally isn't saying what most CXers are saying, which is customer experience is actually what the customer feels and perceives throughout the experience. So it has to do with the memorability and just maybe that adds somehow to what you were saying, that it's not so much about the processes and the digitization and I don't know what. Sure, that composes the experience as a whole, but what people actually take away from the experience, what they remember is what they felt. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, uh, there's even there's a whole lot of study right around around memory of the experience and the emotion that is left behind. So that's where I think, yes, it is about the interactions, but the real emotion and connectivity you're going to have with the company really doesn't come from that particular interaction. So let me tell you what I do think we need to focus on, which is we need to shift to a definition that was put forth by Gene Bliss um, and, and others, which is Customer experience is really about the company delivering on its brand promise or purpose, right? The brand promise is what you are articulating to your customers. They can expect from your brand, from your organization, right? It's, it, it's what differentiates you from your competitors if you strip away labels, right? Independent even of the product. So Apple, right? Think different, extends beyond into everything they do. They think differently about how they develop their products. They think different. They help you think differently as an individual. It's why their stores are packed with people. Now, nobody likes waiting online for the iPhone to come out. There's, you know, there's, there's parts of their experience that aren't enjoyable and, you know, stand out, but they're delivering on a much bigger purpose, which is why they have the loyalty that they do. So I think that emotion and, and memorability, it's where does it apply and how do we think about it? And we are always talking you know, CXers are, ourselves, we're guilty of this. We talk about the journey touch points and moments, but I think it's a bigger connection into that brand promise and designing a system, the company to deliver on that purpose so that we can shift how we do it as new technologies come out, right? We, then we know where to focus to keep delivering on that bigger audacious goal we have as, as an organization. You're listening to Voices of Customer Experience. If you want more CX content, visit us at worthix.com to download one of our customer experience ebooks, subscribe to our blog, and get our newsletter on the future of CX delivered to your inbox. Um, I heard a podcast, maybe it was one that you did with uh, Gene Bliss, um, and where you talked about the peak end rule, uh, Kahneman, Daniel Kahneman's. Uh, Kahneman and Traversky, if I'm not mistaken, I think I remember actually, um, you talking about how we should consider designing experiences that actually peak. So provoking that peak to cause memorability. Um, is that, is that right? Absolutely. Yeah. So if we understand, let's say the, the, let's talk about how we, and where we apply that, because I think that's the shift that I'm suggesting that we make. 
yes, we want to do the peak end rule, but we've got to do it in the areas that really reinforce that brand promise in the experience. Right. So let's, let's take the brand promise and, and let's talk about how we would translate that into the experience. Then know how do we start to use the peak end rule, which is, you know, at the end of the day, you, you remember the, um, you know, the, the end of that experience has that memorability, but we also have to know where to apply that because if we apply it in the wrong parts of the process that, that don't make that emotional connection, we're not going to get the kind of financial impact we want. We're not going to deliver the kind of value we want for the customer. Right. The moment will be lost. Right. So if we think about how do we now take, if we take this notion of we want to really have CX being about delivering on the brand promise, how do we start to think about that structurally so that we can then know how to apply things like peak end rule? How do we then engage in the emotions? How do we create those experiences that reflect, you know, the brand? Um, So here, here's how I have been thinking about it. It's really moving from customer experience design to customer, let's call it customer system design. So a system is an interconnected elements organized to achieve a purpose. That's the definition of system. And it really, for me, that's what CX is. And it's our job as CX practitioners to design the experiences or interconnections so that there's that value exchange between the organization and the customer. So we think about it this way, right? Picture two boxes side by side. You've got on one side that brand promise, right? It's crafted in a way that enables it to be measurable. It's that idea of what the company is there to do. We talked about Apple. We can also take Cadillac. Cadillac is an expressive symbol of arrival, right? It's about success. If we look on the customer, that second box of what the customer is looking for in that brand promise exchange, what we're trying to really help them feel is the emotion of achievement. Right, so if we think about what Pine is saying, the whole notion of, of, of emotion, we think about how we help deliver on that promise, what we want to do is really deliver on that expressive symbol of arrival, making that customer feel a sense of achievement overall, right? That's the bigger brand relationship. Sure. So, right. Then we can double click and say, well, how do we translate that into the experience? So imagine there's that, you know, interaction going between those two things. And I think about it in, and this is how we've been thinking about sort of structurally, is there will be three elements that you need to consider, right? Not just the service experience, but also price and the product. So if we think about it from a Cadillac perspective, Cadillac has a high price. That's not going to be a high point or memorable moment in the experience. Let's face it. When you have to write that check, it's like... (laughs) (laughs) However, in exchange for that, because remember, it's a system, it's a value exchange, you get a high touch, exquisite experiences, right? You're going to walk into that showroom and it's going to have fine art hanging on the walls and old automobiles with classic beauty. It's, you're going to get, um, you have coffee shops with high end coffee, right? It's going to be right. exquisite, right? And the quality of the product is just amazing. So there's this value exchange that's happening. So as we think about it as CX practitioners come all the way back around, it's not just that experience of coming through the showroom and buying the car, but zooming out and saying, look, it's super important that, you know, in exchange for that price point that we deliver something great on those other two variables of of, uh, service and product. For us as consumers, I think it's a question of whether or not something is worth it. And if right. it's worth it, we will pay for it. And and Pine also talked about that when, when, when the experience is memorable, you'll keep going back and you will pay a higher price to get that experience. Uh, yeah. So, and that's where the Starbucks example, too. I mean, Starbucks comes all the, up all the time, right? It's the X example. But, you know, given their most recent um, challenge, right? The store manager having that customer sort of arrested. Let's let's yes. take a look at it through this purpose lens, right? Their purpose is to inspire and nurture human spirit. And they have this need state of belonging. So like Cadillac, right, that price point is is a low point in the experience because it's high. But that exchange is you get that third place, you get your customized coffee. So when they fail to deliver on that purpose, this is why the company is closing down the stores and training everybody. It's so significant because it fundamentally 
you know, breaks down that trust on that purpose. And as CX professionals, right, we really have to help our companies to understand what really is it that we need to, to, un- to manage, right, across those three variables. And then how do we listen to the customers and understand how we're doing on those? With, with rising customer expectations, how do companies keep up with, you know, what their customers really want and measure that and stay on brand? Well, I think if you've got the core understanding of that value exchange, you do have to monitor how are you doing. So like a Borders, if they're, you know, if their customer is shifting to using different ways of consuming what they sell, or they have different expectations of how it's going in that journey. And if you can then start to monitor, well, how are we doing? I mean, you know, you're going to have those low points. You don't want them to go too low, but you have to make sure that those high points that really align to delivering on that purpose are sustained and monitor those all the time. And it is harder and harder to do that, as you know, because things change so quickly. So I think you have to start looking at behaviors. um, And we can talk a little bit too about the kinds of measures we need to put in place, because I think NPS and CSAT, they're lagging indicators. They don't necessarily keep you up on top of what the customers are are thinking today. So we do need to make some shifts, right, to to be much more agile and on top of what's happening in the moment and you know, what customers are doing right in that moment. Moving into measuring CX, which is the next topic that we wanted to address. uh, What do you think the future is? Where do you think it's going? We have artificial intelligence. We have all these new disrupting technologies that are coming into play. What do you think we're moving into when it comes to what's the key to align uh, business performances when measuring CX? Yeah, and I agree. I think AI and CX is a revolution that we're going to go through. And I think it's going to be at least as big as what the internet just did for us. It's going to enable massive changes in the way we can engage with customers. And that's where, again, to zoom out, right? We zoom out to look at purpose. We need to take a look at some measures that, you know, it's great. We can have NPS and CSAT and all our, you know, time, time measurements, first call response. But if we go up one level, we can then start to sort of see the forest for the trees. And I think this is going to be important because accelerating AI and the application is really going to require understanding the outcomes, right? We're trying to drive for customers and for the business. How do we improve acquisition, retention, and loyalty? And those current measures don't really help us to do that. So there were three things that we did in my team to help us to better understand let's call it our customer behaviors. Um, One, we took a look at how do we look at how we're doing in that brand performance. We took a look at customer lifetime value and putting that model in place and share of wallet. And I can talk through how we did each one of those, but each of those areas helped us really understand how are customers behaving when it comes to growth and loss of the customer, right? Are we retaining them? Are they staying? Are they buying more? So then we could take a look at across those three variables to really understand what's happening with the customer and know we're doing great with this group, this group, not so much. This is, and again, this is just the analytics side of it. Then we can go in and really understand the why um, and start to be able to fix that and apply the technologies to drive the right outcomes for those customer segments. But without having a bigger metrics, it's really hard to see what's happening in terms of the bigger behavior. Sure. So what are the things that we should put in place to monitor these things? I think having an understanding of how you're doing on the brand performance, and that's pretty simply, do your customer prefer you over the competition? Is the number one driver of their spend is going to be, you know, will they come to you first? So I use the, the example, I might go into Macy's and buy socks and underwear because, well, you know, they got it's fine quality and I like the price point and I go in and I buy, spend my 20 bucks on socks and underwear. Uh, but if Macy's doesn't know that I actually prefer Nordstrom's and I go over to Nordstrom's and I spend hundreds of dollars, they're not going to know that, you know, oh, great. Oh, I love buying socks and underwear. Give you a great NBS score. I'm <laughs> right. all happy. Great CSAT. But all my money's going over to, to somebody to else. Nordstrom or somewhere, yeah. Right. <laughs> and I only drop in for a couple of things. So really understanding where do you fall and what are those drivers of loyalty is really critical and can really help you to understand because it it ultimately correlates to how much you spend with a company. 
how do you think we could do that? How can, how can we find out what the customer prefers, what drives customer loyalty, what drives customers to buy? Well, we, we did a, um, extensive global research, a study to uncover those key drivers of the brand. And then ultimately we started to track them by, by asking customers and by, by seeing their behaviors. But it's really a, it was a global survey that we ended up put in place to track those, those measures. And I know that's probably old fashioned. Now you guys will tell me, look, we can do that so much easier. <laughs> but we wanted to get, I think you wanted to get the crux of what is it that makes our customers prefer us so that we could then go in and say, how are we doing on those things? <laughs> if we can get into that really quick, uh, once you, it, it, regardless of the, the method that you use for your surveys and for gathering, for mining um, these insights, how do you process it? Was there something that you used in your last project that really helped you um, go beyond just intuition and actually understand what was driving customers? Yeah, we we did a, an extensive study to say, what are the key drivers of brands? So let me take the example of, um, I was at Cisco, right? Leading, leading the brand performance at Cisco. Um, and what we were through... Um, a number of different methods, research methods from talking to customers to uh, surveys on some of the key variables, we were able to uncover a couple of things that were really key. They, they can, and remember, we're one of the companies that really has a higher price point for that quality and for that great service, right? Much like a Cadillac or a... Um, and so what was really important for us to be able to continue that value, value exchange is obviously we have to be the most innovative. Um, they wanted a, to know that we were looking around corners, that we had their back, that we were thinking two steps ahead. Uh, and that tech leadership was so critically important for us to maintain that value exchange. So it's really so it's getting, part of the expectations that people created around that brand. Exactly. Right? And getting at those core brand expectations. So then we could then measurably... Um, you know, monitor how we were doing on those things. How were, how did our customers feel we were delivering on them? And it was interesting because we just launched a, a whole network intuitive, which is a whole new capability for the network that's got AI built in and machine learning and, and the latest technologies. And it was interesting as we were watching these brand trends, our tech leadership had started to dip and so did our revenue. So we could see a correlation between how we were delivering on those brand variables um, and what the company performance. And after we released our sort of, you know, next wave of, of networking, um, you, you can see, I mean, it's public, right? Cisco's revenue has been going up. So, you know, not that that's the only reason, but certainly it's kind of key to know that, you know, to be able to know and then inform leadership um, from a CX perspective on how you're doing on that brand promise and those key, key deliverables. To learn more on how companies such as Verizon, TechCrunch, Blizzard Studios, Volvo, and FICO are using our artificial intelligence and behavioral analytics to measure customer decisions through voice of customer surveys, visit worthix.com. So let me ask you something very specific. Um, which you may or may not be able to answer. Uh, do you think that the insight that, that you gathered through that project, the actions that leadership was able to um, perform based on that insight, can you determine a, a causation between that and the increased revenue or it's, it's more a correlation? I think it was more at this point because we're still, I don't think we have enough time and enough data. Um, we've only been doing this for you know, about a, a year and a half. Um, so I can't, I can't say that we could, we could tie it in a, and say resolutely, but I would say that what was also happening just, which sort of set me off on this starting to think about how do we change the axis? I personally was going through some of the same things that, that some of the, some of the other folks out there were, are going through in terms of our NPS was going up. Right. Our, our satisfaction stores were going up as our revenue was going down. So I knew that, that I couldn't go in front of leadership and show those numbers and go, we're doing great over here. Well, the company was not. But now as we started to look at the brand drivers and how we were performing on those, there was at least a relationship between those that we could see the decline in some of those key drivers. Um, and then as we launched the new products that met some of those needs, 
we could see that shift back. So I think it's going to take some time to be able to say, yeah, this is a specific cause and effect, but we definitely, at least it was more aligned with business performance than what we'd been looking at before. And as, as a CXer, what would you like to see AI and innovation bring that you feel could equip you or, or give you better tools to, to, to be able to deliver to the C-suite, say, this is the science, this is the actual data. So this is not our intuition. This is, this is what the numbers are saying and, and be able to present it in the way. What, what are your expectations uh, towards the future and what um, technology is going to bring? Well, I, I think the AI is really about the predictive and getting ahead of the trends. So it would be nice if we weren't looking at declines in both our you know, performance on our drivers and our revenue at the same time. But in fact, we could actually predict if we saw there was going to be a dip and ha- get ahead of it, right? So that we would be able to not be in a situation that's a fix, but instead be able to monitor and stay on top of things and continue to have, you know, evolve and have that profitable growth. So I think that predictive element is going to be huge. Right. Predictive models, right? Mm-hmm. And what would your advice be to companies who have to keep up with the speed of change in their customers' expectations? We talked about how at Cisco people had this expectation that they always had to be uh, spearheading the revolution of innovation, et cetera. Um, what would your advice be? I think first is you, 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 you need to know what those are, right? If you don't know what, what, the core purposes and what the expectations of the customers first, get that really clear, right? You, you've got to do the work to understand that. What is that value exchange, right? If you look at that price product service, where is it that you need to focus? And then what is it that, that there's that expectation that you can have from the customers in more of that emotional side, right? The, um, that ownable feeling and that promise, you've got to get that really nailed down because I think if you don't have that CX strategy in place, it becomes very difficult to know where to focus and how to guide the company. So that's why I think that's so critical because we tend to go, you know, a lot is talked about going in and sort of, you know, mapping out the end-to-end customer journey and finding out where customers are screaming most and fixing it. But without the strategy to understand that that value exchange of what really needs to be the highs and the lows, I think it's really difficult to be a strategic CX person and, and help guide the business. So if we, if we were to um, just kind of wrap it up into takeaways for the listener, um, starting all the way up at the top and going back down, um, what would be the, the bullet points that you would say, hey, if you want to make change in your company, if you want to do things differently, here are the steps for you to follow? Yeah, I think it, it starts with if the brand delivers on its promise, customers are going to reward it by buying more and staying and even weathering through changes you make as a company. Mm-hmm. So you need to help the company to gain clarity of your purpose in a way that you can measure it and really identify that value equation, the highs and lows of the experience across service, product, and price. And then stru- that way you have that structure in place. So you're not just running around putting in file fires or trying to stop the bleeding when customers are defecting, it gives you that core uh, purpose to, or core focus, right, for your innovation. And then I think the second is you need to adopt those measures that are going to help you understand how you're doing on it. We talked about brand preference. There are other things you can put in place to understand customer growth and loss. Um, share of wallet models, for example, right, where you can understand how much the customer is spending with your company versus the competition, like I was spending with Macy's versus Nordstrom. So that you as the CX, you know, representatives or the customer representatives in the company can really say, here's, here's the trends that are happening with the customer. If you have those core things in place from a strategic perspective, then you can start to problem solve around how, how to better deliver, how to improve changes if you're seeing downward trends. But that's the steering. Those are the dashboards I think we need today. We need those bigger, that bigger focus and those, those dashboards. Very well said, Rachel. We couldn't agree more. Well, we appreciate you hanging out with us and sharing your take on how CX should evolve. Thank you so much for having me. I love talking about this stuff. <laughs> well, we appreciate it. We will keep up with you and hopefully we will do this again. I would love that. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you for listening. 
Don't miss our podcast next week with CX Thought Leader Jean Bliss to discuss her new book, Would You Do That to Your Mother? I love that title. And the importance of maintaining the human touch and the customer experience. Voices of Customer Experience is brought to you by Worthix. This podcast is produced by Crystal Garrett, Mary Drummond, and edited by Anthony Sledge. To hear more and subscribe, go to worthix.com to get more material.